Well, thank you for joining us here today. How's, how's everybody doing? Yeah. Good. <laughs> well, thanks for, for taking a little bit of a break from the, the constant chaos of the end of the semester. Uh, I know it's a difficult time for everybody. Uh, but we appreciate you being here. Um, before we get going, I want to quickly thank HDNR and the Department of Anthropology for agreeing to put this talk on. Um, I think it's great to have all of us here in the same room um, from biology, HDNR, from anthropology, from other fields, because um, it's great to, to be able to encourage interdisciplinary collaboration, which I think is kind of the core of, uh, of what we do nowadays in, in a lot of fields of science. So it's good to take the first step of getting everybody together. Um, so it's my great pleasure today to welcome Dr. Brenna Hen uh, to our campus. For many years, Dr. Hen has been a leader in the field of human population genetics and interdisciplinary research on human history, and her work has led to significant breakthroughs in our scientific understanding of the ancient origins of humankind, the deep history of migrations across the African continent, the co-evolution of the unique click languages of Southern Africa, and many other fascinating topics. Dr. Hen spent the majority of her early career at Stanford University uh, from her bachelor's degree in philosophy of science all the way up to her doctoral and postdoctoral work in anthropology and human genomics in Carlos Bustamante's lab. Uh, with a brief interlude in between working with 23andMe on uh, uh, private ancestry research <coughs> with uh, Joanna Mountain. So following her postdoc, she took a faculty position as an assistant professor with the Department of Ecology and Evolution at Stony Brook University, uh, where she worked for several years before moving to UC Davis just a few months ago uh, to join them as an associate professor in the Department of Anthropology. Uh, Dr. Hen has worked in Africa for many years, and primarily in South Africa and Namibia, and has developed valuable relationships and collaborations with local peoples there. Um, she's encouraged the growth and capacity of African scientists as well, through initiatives such as H3 Africa, to conduct their own research and maintain, maintain control over their own data. Uh, some of Dr. Hen's recent work has focused on the genetic underpinnings of factors related to human health and disease, and skin pigmentation, which she may talk about today, if we're all good. <laughs> and so now I'd like to turn things over to Dr. Hen. Uh, and please, everybody, help me welcome her to Colorado State University. Hi, thank you so much for having me. And thank you for the uh, wonderful introduction, which you, I feel like you could just keep going. You just oh, start flipping the slides. You already know everything. It's great. Um, yeah, so this is a really uh, interdisciplinary audience, and I've tried to tailor my talk um, to be interdisciplinary. Um, but one of the downsides is, especially with genetics, there's you know, a lot of nomenclature. There's not a lot of technical terms. So if you have questions, please feel free to interrupt me. I really, I don't mind. Just you know, wave your hand, and like we'll we'll go through stuff. Okay. So uh, my focus today is primarily on thinking about modern human origins uh, within Africa. And those include trying to answer, I think, some major questions that genetics um, uh, provide relevant data for. So that include things like, was there a bottleneck associated with the origin of modern humans, or is ancient population structure across the African continent uh, more likely? When is the earliest time of population divergence amongst all humans? Um, for a, a long time, it was actually thought to be uh, relatively shallow. Now we're pushing it back a little bit further. But you know, in the, in the context of geological time, it's still very, very recent. Um, where, where was the origin within Africa? If indeed we think that uh, Homo sapiens have sort of a single ancestral population, then that ancestral population must have been located somewhere on the continent in a geographic region. So can we actually figure out what that region was? Um, or do we think that actually multiple ancestral populations all contributed to the formation of the species? This is a, a big open question right now. And then, um, and then the, I'm going to actually try to spend almost half the talk on this last question, which is, are there important phenotypic adaptations either in the common ancestral population or after um, humans began to expand and disperse across the continent that facilitated their ability to um, grow um, in terms of population size or to adapt in, in different ways to their local environments? Um, so I have a couple of examples of this that we've been working on in my lab, and one is skin pigmentation, and the other is malarial resistance. So I'm going to kind of float through a few of those examples and, and see what you guys think. Um, but first, I want to uh, focus on this question about um, when and where in Africa did we originate, um, because I'm just 
obsessed with this question. So uh, when I was a PhD student, uh, one of my uh, committee uh, members was Dr. Richard Klein. And Dr. Klein is a, a famous paleoanthropologist, and he had very, um, he had a very sort of rigid view of, of how humans uh, formed and, and uh, cultural evolution and the difference between the Middle Stone Age and the later Stone Age. So he had this model in mind. Um, and I thought, well, as a geneticist, how can I contribute to either falsifying or supporting this particular model? And one thing that I can do is try to figure out where in Africa the ancestral population lived. So um, I began doing work with different hunter-gatherer populations, um, both in Tanzania as well as in southern Africa, where we established a field site. Um, and right, uh, sort of right after we started publishing some of our first work, there was a nice review written by um, Cara uh, Bettini and, um, and Joe Blaine that would try to summarize both genetic and non-genetic evidence for this question, or even whether or not this question is um, is something that we can answer. So on one hand, we have uh, genetic evidence, and that includes things like the Y chromosome, right? So the uh, chromosome which is inherited from fathers to sons and passed on just through the paternal lineage. Um, we have mitochondrial DNA, which is passed on only maternally from mothers to their children, and then only the daughters then pass it on to their children. And they have particular geographic or what we call phylogeographic patterns across Africa, and then we had some evidence from the autosomes or nuclear DNA and looking at things just like genetic diversity or this fancier term called linkage disequilibrium, um, which are really just proxies for how large was the effective population size of humans at that time. And so one of the um, interesting results to come out of the genetics over the last um, few years was that um, for the Y chromosome data, it actually looks like the deep lineages are sort of dispersed across different parts of Africa. There are deep lineages in Western Africa, in Southern Africa, in Eastern Africa, so there wasn't much of a phylogeographic signature there. In the mitochondrial DNA, it's a bit more clear, actually. There's, um, most of the basal lineages are actually rooted in Southern Africa or distinguish Southern Africa from Eastern Africa. So that was maybe pointing towards Southern and Eastern Africa as being an important locus for the earliest population divergence. And then when we started looking at the nuclear data, the autosomal data, we, um, we as well as um, Tish, uh, Sarah Tishkoff's group, both came to the uh, similar conclusion, which is that across all African populations that have been surveyed, the ones that have the highest genetic diversity are these Khoisan populations that are found, at least currently, in southwestern Africa. Okay, so that was sort of a, a striking result. And, you know, if you were going to then pick a place in Africa where um, humans have the largest effective population size and possibly the most likely place for an ancestral origin, it would have been maybe southern Africa. Okay? If we move over and look at uh, non-genetic evidence, right, there's evidence um, from morphology of, um, of crania that uh, people have been dead and buried for a long time, right, so how do we define what are anatomically modern humans or what are pre-anatomically modern humans, and there's certainly evidence now of anatomically modern humans from Eastern Africa that date to about 160,000 years ago, and this is the Herto specimen. Um, there are other, uh, there's other evidence um, from Southern Africa, as well as the recent redating of uh, Jebel Arud. Um, Jebel Arud is dated to about 300,000 years ago, although anatomically it's considered more near modern than modern. Anyway, so you get into a little bit of this debate about what's modern and not modern, uh, but they certainly anticipate uh, the modern human form in North Africa, East Africa, and Southern Africa. So all of those locations still look plausible from the morphological side. If you then look at evidence of cultural evolution, like shell beads or rock art, then also we get into this a bit of a debate. <laughs> there are shell beads in North Africa as well as Southern Africa um, that are dated quite, to be quite old, 100, 120,000 years ago even. Um, the earliest evidence of, of rock art is still putatively from Southern Africa, and there's these little, um, it's, see that little Xine mark? It's just a piece of ochre and it has this cross hatching on it, actually two pieces of ochre that have this cross hatching on it. And uh, those are dated to be about 70,000 years old, um, and, and so they've been proposed to be really the first evidence of symbolic behavior 
um, that is in the, in the archaeological record. So, um, you know, I think the point that they were trying to make with this review is it's, it's not a settled question, right? Um, even taking the genetic evidence, there are some indications that uh, it, it's not just Southern Africa or, or it's a more complex process that's going on. And then certainly if you look at the archaeological information, um, it's also more of a mixed bag. So um, I really have been thinking a lot about how to address this particular question. Um, and so I've set up a series of models, and what I'd like to do is kind of walk through these models a little bit so we are all on the same page in terms of um, what, what am I thinking about. So I'm a very model-based person. I like to have, uh, well, I'm a population geneticist, so we have effective population sizes and migration rates, and when did populations diverge? Like, we like to parameterize everything. And when I talk to paleoanthropologists, sometimes they have much much broader models in mind, and it can be really challenging to try to integrate the two types of information um, because we don't, we don't necessarily think the same way. So I'm working on a review article right now with a, um, a zoo archaeologist and um, a paleoanthropologist to try to actually integrate uh, genetic models along with you know, what they think is going on in Africa. It's very challenging. But here's, here's what we do now. <laughs> so if you went back to what's called the Middle Stone Age period, which is about 250,000 years ago up to about 50,000 years ago, there's plenty of evidence of, um, of Homo sapiens living on the African landscape. Okay? And that includes all of these sites that you see in Southern Africa as well as sites in Eastern Africa. And there's a whole entire separate map that I'm not showing here, which is North Africa. So we know if you went back 200,000, 300,000 years ago, there were lots of populations across the African landscape. Okay? They're making stone tools and all that good stuff. Um, and then, like I said, there's, there's good uh, cranial evidence now from several sites, and including uh, Jebel, as well as Herto and Singa, um, lots of different specimens, which um, indicate that modern humans are evolved anatomically between 300,000 and 150,000 years ago. So the specimen from Herto, which is sometimes kind of considered the type specimen, um, is, is certainly more robust than anybody's cranium in this room, if you were to deflush yourself and start measuring yourself. But, um, <laughs> In many other ways, it's, it's very similar uh, to you and me. Um, so there's very little midfacial prognathism. So the mid part of the face is sort of tucked in underneath the forehead. The forehead is very um, tall. It's very high. The um, brain case is short from front to back. It has um, a brain size that actually exceeds most of the people in this room. Um, and so on and so forth. So there are a lot of diagnostic anatomical features which certainly anticipate modern humans or look very similar to modern humans in Ethiopia. Okay, so then how do we take all these different types of information and create um, testable models? which is what I really want to do. So I started mocking up these, these maps, so um, forgive me, I'm just going to go through this. Um, so one possibility is that we've got populations in Southern Africa, Eastern Africa, Northern Africa, and they're structured from each other. And structure is a, is a kind of formal genetic term, and what it means is that there is a minimal gene flow between those populations. So people are not moving between Southern Africa and Eastern Africa. They've, you know, for whatever reason, they're up there and they just, they don't migrate between regions, okay? Or it's very, very low level migration. So let's say this is what's going on 200,000, 150,000 years ago. Um, we think the environments are probably quite distinct, at least amongst these three different regions at that time. I've been trying to review some of the uh, geological information on this, and that's really a challenge for me. So I don't know if anybody here knows more about some of these time periods than I do, but you're welcome to pipe up. Um, but the other point I really want to make is that if all of these populations are modern humans, okay, and I were to sample um, sort of modern humans from Southern Africa, Eastern Africa, Northern Africa today that had their ancestors in these regions, their, their common ancestor would be very, very deep, right? Because these populations had to migrate and diverge into each of these regions by 200,000 years ago. So that means that their common ancestral population is even older than that, and probably substantially older. With, uh, with Jebel now dated to 300,000, you know, the common ancestral population would have to predate 300,000 years ago. So under this model, you have a really, really old common ancestral divergence. Alternatively, we can have something that's called panmixia, 
where the populations can migrate freely across the landscape or something close to freely. Um, and this really means that, that the migration rates are quite high. That's, in terms of population genetics, that's what we're thinking about. We have very, very um, uh, non-zero migration rates, essentially. And this actually, this model is more of what the archaeologists have in mind, at least from the ones that I've spoken to, is that you, you have radiations out of different areas, but there's not a lot of structure in between these different regions. You know, you have shell beads, let's say, somebody invents shell beads in North Africa, and because there's lots of cultural and demic exchange with North Africa and East Africa, then that idea spreads to East Africa, and then it spreads to Southern Africa. So people are moving across that landscape quite a bit. So the other, you know, when I put this model together, the panmictic model, think about it from a population genetics perspective. If, if this is what's going on, then we have a very, very large effective population size also, okay? So, um, because all of these different groups are contributing then to the present day population. So, in, in the sense, these two models are nice in, in that they predict having a very large effective population size and having a deep common ancestral um, root for everyone. And that's something we can actually try to predict from the genetics. Um, so, I'm not going um, to be more persuasive, I'm not even going to cite my own work here, I'm going to cite work by other colleagues. Um, and what they've been, they've been doing, these two papers are from 2011, I think, yeah, 2012, 2011, um, is they tried to date when is the oldest population divergence amongst modern human populations. And so in each of these models, they had uh, a Khoisan genome or genomes. Um, here are the, uh, the forest pygmy populations. These are western and eastern uh, pygmy populations. And these are, uh, well, these are Niger Cordofanian or western African populations. And we have something similar here where we have a Khoisan genome um, and a western African ancestry genome and then Europeans and other people. And they both use completely different models actually to do this divergence dating. It's completely different data sets. They're independent groups. And they both came up with very similar estimates, which was very striking. So uh, the Varamidal paper estimated the divergence between the Khoisan and everybody else was about 110,000 years ago with wide confidence intervals between 50 and 180. And uh, the Sie Adam Sieples group estimated that the earliest divergence time was about 110 to 130,000 years ago. Okay, sort of, there's a little bit of uncertainty in the mutation rate, but they're getting very striking, strikingly similar estimates of the earliest divergence time. So 110 to, let's say, 150,000 years ago, really, if you go back, um, these maps I'm talking about, it, they don't fit very well. Because here, I already have populations all across the landscape. Whereas in the genetic evidence that I've just shown you, those populations only begin to diverge 150 or even less, 110,000 years ago. So these two models that I presented, we think do not fit the genetic data particularly well. So now we have to come up with alternative models for what's going on. Okay. Does that make sense to everybody? Yeah, awesome. Okay, so one hypothesis is that there is a refugium somewhere in Africa. And um, I'm going to posit here it's a, a southern African refugium, very broadly speaking, and I'll present a little bit of evidence um, for that particular hypothesis. But the idea uh -huh. is that the substructure in Africa is just not very old. So therefore, people had to be in one particular place if we went back 100 to 100, 150,000 years ago. Um, so one way to try to get everybody into one region of Africa is to have um, a vast refugium. And that could occur if you have dramatic climate, uh, dramatic climate fluctuations that can occur. So people are probably more familiar with the last glacial maximum, right? And the last glacial maximum in uh, northern Europe and Asia forces human populations down into southern refugia. And this is really not a controversial hypothesis. It, at least in Europe, it forces people into the Iberian Peninsula, the Italian Peninsula, and then into um, southern, the southern Ukraine area. And then when the last glacial maximum ends and the temperature begins to warm in the Holocene, then populations essentially move north. So they expand out of this, these refugia. So this is, a, this is sort of based on that model. I think, okay, well, could we apply that model to Africa, where people from Eastern Africa get sort of forced down into Southern Africa because of, of droughts or other climatic fluctuations? 
Okay, so the, one of the, um, and then there's local, and then maybe there's a lot of local extinction occurring elsewhere. Yeah, sorry. So um, the reason that I sort of came up with that particular idea was um, based on the Schultz paper from 2007, um, and it's a, they're a geologists, and they were looking at um, lake levels, both in uh, Lake Malawi as well as a lake in, um, in Western Africa. And they observed that there was evidence for um, massive droughts actually between about 130,000 years ago until roughly 70,000 years ago. Um, so uh, <laughs> this is, I'll try to point you through this. So this is the lake level in Malawi and it goes, it goes down and then it has sort of a, a sharp return to high levels and it goes down again. So that's about 120,000 years ago. And then from roughly 120 to about 70 here, it's really very low. And then after about 70, 60,000 years ago, um, the lake levels begin to recover. It has a little bit of variation. And then this is what you see, you know, pretty much stays static until the present day. Um, so they, they um, actually observed that this um, hyperaridity or the very uh, hyperaridity or the very low lake levels that were observed were far more severe than that with the, which was observed in the last glacial maximum. So they're saying these events that were occurring in tropical Africa, in both Eastern Africa as well as Western Africa, were actually incredibly um, long, stressful periods of um, aridity um, with uh, the occasional spike, okay? So, um, this, and they actually proposed this, it wasn't, wasn't my idea, that this may have forced populations either to go extinct locally or to move down into southern Africa, which has a very different um, climatic, uh, well, it has, a, it has a very different ecological pattern than um, tropical Africa or northern Africa, okay? And then that became sort of a, a large-scale refugium, and then after about 75,000 years ago, when um, the humidity began to increase, particularly in the tropical um, Africa, and then actually southern Africa goes a bit dry between 60 and 70, so then that sort of forced populations up into eastern Africa, and then they spread out into the rest of the world. So this is what um, they proposed. I, you know, this paper is now 10 years old. I've been trying to do a little bit more research to see um, how well this model continues to be supported. And like I said, if anybody in here knows anything else about this, please let me know. But this is sort of what I'm working off of right now. Um, so you would have had, let's say, this refugium in southern Africa and then expansion into eastern, western, and obviously northern Africa, and then movement out of Africa at 50, 60,000 years ago. Okay? So, um, you know, this, this model, I think, does a better job of fitting the genetic data. Um, but right now, it is very much a model. We still need to parameterize it. Um, I think there are other ways of, of testing it very formally, but it does, broadly speaking, fit the genetic patterns of diversity that we see across Africa as well as out of Africa much better than either these panmictic models or um, these ancient population structure models. Um, so right now, I'm in favor of a mostly single origin model for Homo sapiens, which is pretty recent, within the last 150,000 years. And there's some sort of refugium and dramatic expansion from one location in Africa, which then sp spreads out and takes over the rest of the world. Now, archaeologists may be very interested in, are there cultural um, innovations that allowed humans to um, expand dramatically during this period? Why didn't they expand dramatically before? So that's, that's like a whole separate conversation. Okay, I'm gonna try to stick with the genetics in the rest of the talk. Um, so just to kind of summarize uh, maybe the midpoint of the talk, you know, the, the place of, of origin is really very dependent on how you are thinking about these different models. Are you thinking about it's a panmictic model for Africa, it's ancient population structure? No, I really think there's like a single location for, you know, Homo sapiens to have originated. So you really have to kind of clarify that before you can even get into the rest of this discussion. Um, some, some caveats with the genetic data. So um, even after the populations diverged and we're looking at genetic diversity, there are other uh, demographic events that can impact uh, genetic diversity. And, and one of them is obviously additional population bottlenecks. So, you know, it's possible that um, you have this population in East Africa, they've diverged, um, 
And then they, they go through like a massive population bottleneck that reduces a lot of their genetic diversity. So then when I sample them today, they don't look like a particularly good proxy for the ancestral population location. So this is sort of a caveat here that we need to think about both recent events that would impact genetic diversity as well as these ancient divergence models. Um, one assumption here that sometimes people find really problematic is that um, when I'm sampling populations today or when we sample populations today, that that's in indicative of where they lived in the past. Okay? So I work with Khoisan populations today. They're in southern Africa. When I think about them, I think, okay, they've been living in southern Africa for a long time because I have no other reason not to think that. But <laughs> other people think, well, they could have just all moved down from eastern Africa in the last 20,000 years. You don't know that they would have been living there for 150,000 years ago. So um, uh, I, I, I published a paper in 2011 that was on the southern African hypothesis, and this was sort of the primary criticism of that paper. So I really began thinking, well, what else could I do to try to um, prove this particular model, especially with genetic data? So one thing that I'm going to try to do is um, use phenotypes, adaptive phenotypes, to infer where in Africa a human population might have originated. Was it in North Africa, East Africa, Southern Africa? So I'll walk you through that in a moment. The other approach one could use is do more demographic modeling. Population geneticists love to do demographic modeling. I will never stop doing it. Um, <laughs> so there's a lot of great new um, computational techniques that have come out in the last few years, and we're really excited to work on those. But I have no new data on that at the moment. Um, another thing people always ask me about is ancient DNA. and like, okay. So the ancient DNA from Africa is super recent. It's all Holocene period ancient DNA. So it doesn't reach back into the Middle Stone Age. It doesn't reach back to 150,000 years ago for various reasons. Um, we don't think it's ever going to do that or not anytime soon. So I don't think ancient DNA is going to solve this particular problem. It can solve other problems, but not this particular one. Um, so one thing I thought of was can we um, predict pick particular phenotypes which look like they would um, adapt to different regions within Africa. And um, there were two really obvious low-hanging fruit to go after here. And one is malarial resistance, because malarial resistance has a very particular um, ecological distribution within Africa. And if we think we know something about how climate has changed um, over the past 150,000 years, it was probably never particularly warm and humid in far southern Africa, so we would not expect populations in far southern Africa to be malarial adapted. So I thought, okay, let's go after this and see when this suite of malarial adaptations occurred in different human populations. And the other was on skin pigmentation. So skin pigmentation um, varies a lot across human populations, as you all know, and um, the most important predictor of this variation is actually latitude. Okay, so um, at, at what population, or at what latitude are you sampling this population? And that explains that almost 50 or 60 percent of the variance in skin pigmentation. So I thought, I, okay, I'm going to I'm going to start with those those two um, phenotypes. Um, I just want to kind of briefly introduce you to the populations that I'm working with and, and the field sites. Um, so I, I still work in Southern Africa today. I've been working there for about 10 years. Um, we have four primary field sites right now. Um, one is in the Cedarburg Mountains, just north of Cape Town. The other is in the Southern Kalahari Desert. Um, the third is in the Richtersveld, which is the first picture I had up on my slides, sort of this rocky, um, very desert mountain terrain. And then the last one is the Himba, who are in far northern Namibia, just on the border with Angola. So um, <coughs> I'm primarily going to focus on just these two populations, which are the Komani-san population as well as the Nama population. Um, the Komani-san are a former hunter-gatherer population that speak a language which is almost extinct. It's called Tlu. Um, there's only about four speakers left today who are quite elderly. And the Nama um, speak a, a Khoi language, which is still more vibrant. There's about 6,000 um, individuals. We think they're still Nama speaking, both in South Africa as well as Namibia. OK, so who are the Khoisan? So um, there are a large variety of terms applied to the Khoisan. When I first started my dissertation, I used to get all sort of like confused in the literature because one paper would call them this and the other paper would call them that, and there was like no consistency across, um, <laughs> across publications. 
So I'm going to refer to them primarily as this uh, joint term called Khoisan, where the Khoi refers to um, the language group primarily, but also historically it meant people were pastoralists. Um, and the San refers to the idea that these people were hunter-gatherers. So when the Europeans arrived, there were, um, all, there were indigenous populations in southern Africa um, that spoke click languages, and some of them had sheep and goat and cattle pastoralism, and others were hunter-gatherers. And so the, they kind of ended up dividing people into two, but um, for various reasons, actually genetically, they're probably really similar to one another and only divided really recently into those two groups. Um, there are other terms you may have heard applied to them. One is Bushman. How many people have heard the Bushman? Probably the most common term. Um, sometimes that's considered a, a derogatory term. Many of the individuals that I work with actually prefer to be self, uh, they, so they self-identify as Bushmen. Um, so while I'm in the field, I might use the term. I don't use the term in the U.S. Um, another term is Hottentot. Have you guys heard the word Hottentot? The Hottentot is like an old kind of 19th century term for um, people who are Nama or, or Khoi Khoi. Um, and that does definitely has a, a derogatory uh, connotation. Um, colored, so colored is an apartheid uh, era term that actually most people who have Khoisan ancestry now self-identify as colored. Um, because in, uh, under a South African system, you are black, white, or colored. And in fact, most people we think with colored ancestry in the Western and Northern Cape are of Khoisan descent. Um, but I, I prefer to use Khoisan. Or you hear Khoi or San or Khoisan with an I. Like, it, people just go wild. OK, so I'm, I'm just going to refer to Khoisan. Um, um, we recently just finished a study where um, we compiled data from about 26 different populations across Southern Africa. And we wanted to know what sort of population structure did we observe um, across the Southern African populations. And um, it was actually very, very striking. So the, the dots on the map indicate the populations that were sampled. And then these colors indicate distinct ancestries. Um, if there's any geneticists in the room, we're using um, a clustering-based algorithm like admixture to infer which ancestries these are. Um, but suffice to say that they're just they're, they're distinct ancestries. So we found that there's this one ancestry, which actually, hopefully you can see that it goes around the Kalahari Desert. Okay, so the Kalahari Desert is sort of central Botswana, and it goes just around the Kalahari, which is a bit, a bit odd. And then we found this, this pink ancestry, which is really focused in uh, central, uh, southern central Kalahari. And that's also distinct from the northern Kalahari ancestry. So even among these different Khoisan populations, there's very divergent ancestries that are still present today that segregate with geography. And um, we were a little confused by this, because when we started looking at language and subsistence strategy, language and subsistence strategy actually don't map neatly onto these ancestry clusters. So the only idea we could really come up with is that the ancestry seems to be more determined by geography, and particularly we think almost by ecozones. So that there are populations in the Kalahari, um, and they are essentially one population that are you know, exchanging migrants um, because they have cultural adaptations to a particular part of the Kalahari in the southern versus the northern, and there's various reasons to think that. And then we have sort of a distinct group of Khoisan that are migrating um, just in the fringe of the Kalahari, which is a very different environment than the central Kalahari. So um, that's what we posited there. And then there are two other common population ancestries in southern Africa. One, um, which is, uh, this is part of the Mopane savanna right here. And these are like the Himba populations that I mentioned earlier. And they're a Bantu-speaking pastoralist population, as well as the Damra. <laughs> and the Damra are Khoi-speaking. So like, you know, we could not neatly sort language onto um, these different ancestries. It was really hard. So these are the Damra and the Himba right here in the Mopani Savannah. And then we have Easter Bantu speakers, which sort of sweep both north, east, and south. And so this is a very recent historical event um, within the last 500 to 600 years. Okay, so that's sort of just like the, the background for um, these different Khoisan populations. Um, so we went out and actually measured skin pigmentation in about 500 individuals from um, my two study sites, the, the Nama and the Romani. And um, we then began to analyze 
what does skin pigmentation look like in these populations relative to the rest of the world? And there's been some very, very nice work done by Nina Jablonski, who's an anthropologist on skin pigmentation. Um, and she and others have demonstrated that there's this beautiful correlation between the absolute value of latitude and the amount of melanin in the skin. Um, and what you're seeing here is actually uh, the coefficient of variation for the distribution rather than the mean. So we also, you know, we replicate that the mean is very, very tightly correlated with latitude, but also how tight or wide your distribution of pigmentation in, is in the population is also tightly correlated with latitude. So this was really um, kind of interesting and, and surprising. Um, I start to think a little bit about the evolution of skin pigmentation. So in my mind, I have this model where Okay, so we have southern African populations that are adapted to um, a relatively a low latitude environment. I mean, far southern Africa is quite far away from equatorial Africa. So they have um, light to moderate skin pigmentation. They have a lot of genetic variation. And then when the populations expand 100,000 years ago into eastern Africa, they take some of these alleles with them. So they move up here. Sorry. Um, they have become adapted to more equatorial um, environments and, and higher uh, ultraviolet radiation. And then as populations then move out of Africa, they take you know, a slightly uh, fewer set of alleles, and then those alleles are then selected for in European and Asian populations for light skin pigmentation in latitudes that are very far from the equator. Skin pigmentation is like the adaptive phenotype in humans, by the way. Um, it just it hits the latitude, it adapts. I mean, I don't know why exactly, but um, it's, it's really powerful. Um, so this is the model that I had in mind, and then we went and looked at the genetic data. <laughs> um, <laughs> and it just turns out that this is like a way, way more complex problem than I initially uh, thought, and it's gonna take me like 10 years to sort out. So um, <laughs> we published our, our first sort of batch of this uh, last year in, in Cell with Alicia Martin as the first author, who's a fantastic uh, geneticist that um, at the Broad, um, and I can't take you through everything, so I'm actually just going to focus on a single gene um, for the purposes of this talk. So this is a, a super famous gene for anybody who's worked on skin pigmentation. It's called SLC24A5. It was the first gene that was identified as contributing to uh, skin pigmentation variation in humans, um, and it lightens skin pigmentation. Okay, it's a, a synonymous uh, mutation. It has at 100% frequency virtually in northern European populations. So if you're from Germany or Sweden or the UK, like you carry this allele for sure. Um, so when we looked at African populations, if you look at West Africans, it's at very low frequency. It's about 5%. And then we looked at the Khoisan, and it's about 25% frequency. Um, and that's after we, we removed some admixture, European admixture from the Khoisan. Um, so we thought, well, 25% 25 frequency, well, that's kind of cool. That actually supports this model that I had where, you know, the allele is very old. It's segregating in southern Africa. And then as uh, populations move north, you know, it's persisting, but it gets sort of selected against in, in the equatorial regions. But then it manages to get out of Africa and then is strongly adaptive in northern Europeans. So I thought this is like my perfect, you know, example. Okay, I was completely wrong, <laughs> um, and I can't, I mean, I just can't take you through all the um, analysis we did to prove it, but I want to show you this model, and this is our final model for the evolution of this gene, <laughs> and it's terrible, right? Like, in order to actually fit the genetic diversity patterns, I had to, like, draw on my, all of the knowledge that we have on Africa um, and, and do a lot of intense simulation. So <coughs> what we ended up doing is that we, we actually model four different populations um, because we know these four populations are interacting over the last uh, 10,000, 20,000 years. So we have Europeans, we have the Khoisan, we've got um, Eastern African populations like pastoralists, and then we have um, the Bantu. And down at the bottom you have the average allele frequencies we use from genetic data um, to do this model. So this allele is at 100% in Europeans, it's about 40% in the Khoisan, it's about 40% in Eastern Africans, and zero in the Bantu. Okay, um, so <laughs> we start by actually, there's very good evidence that there's migration from Europe into Eastern Africa during the Holocene, okay? 
So we went ahead and modeled that. Okay, so we've got this migration event from Europe into Eastern Africa about five to 10,000 years ago. It's low migration, not too crazy. But if the allele originated in Europe, it could have brought the allele to Eastern Africa. Okay? And then there's also good evidence of a demographic migration event from East Africa to Southern Africa, which is 2,000 years ago. And this is when sheep and goat and cattle come into Southern Africa. The pastoralists bring them in, and then the koi adopt them, and then they expand. So that's about 2,000 years ago. So we said, OK, well, let's say that migration event happens. Could that allele have been transmitted during the migration event? And then it will be present in the koi san about 2,000 years ago. And then, uh, and then we have the bantu, where it's just, it's just not present. So all of these are the different parameters of the final model. <laughs> Um, it looks really convoluted, but actually we tested against neutral models, and we did this in a very hierarchical fashion, and this does end up being the best fitting model. So um, what happens is the allele comes in from Eastern Africa. It's brought into the Khoisan about 2,000 years ago. It immediately, selection starts occurring on it. Very, very strong selection. And then we have an additional infusion of European genes, because the Europeans hit South Africa about you know, during the colonial period, so 150 years ago. They have about 14% migration, and then we end up with a final day allele frequency about 40%. And when you actually model the selection coefficient for this, because we can reject a neutral model completely, the selection coefficient is about 4 to 5% in both the Nama and the, the Kamani. So it's like incredibly, incredibly strong selection. I mean, this is like, if you've heard about selection for lactase persistence, like the ability to drink milk, this is as strong as that, but it's such a recent, it's such a recent event. I mean, the, the haplotypes between the Khoisan and the Europeans are identical. I mean, that's why we had to go with this model. Like, we resequenced the entire gene for 400 individuals, and it's identical <laughs> between the Khoisan and the Europeans. Like, it's not standing variation. It's not 100,000 years old. It's this really, really recent event. So, um, after all, doing all of this model-based work, we basically end up with this conclusion that there's rapid evolution of lighter skin pigmentation in the Khoisan in just the last 1,500 years. Now, this one gene only explains a little bit of the variation in skin pigmentation. Um, it's, it explains about 12% of the variation, so it doesn't explain you know, most of it, but it seems like it was a really kind of important selective event occurring in the Khoisan. So, um, like I said, it's, it sort of completely is, um, does not support my ancestral <laughs> standing variation model for the Khoisan, but again, it's just one locus, so we're now trying to model this for many, many skin pigmentation genes, which is a huge amount of work. Okay, so I'm just gonna uh, quickly go through my last example, which is um, for uh, uh, malaria. So this is the distribution of Plasmodium falciparum, um, which causes malaria, um, at least presently in Africa. So you can see it's at very high frequency in, in Central and Western Africa. Um, and then it really tapers off, especially as you get into either North Africa or um, Southern Africa. And um, the map just over there, which you hopefully you can see that there's a pretty strong geographic correlation between the two. Um, that's what's called the Duffy Null allele. So the Duffy Null allele um, is um, this allele that confers resistance to a different type of plasmodium, plasmodium vivax. But people have had hypothesized that it was essentially um, uh, an allele that allowed ancient humans to um, adapt to having malaria in their environments. So um, with uh, Kimberly McManus, who was a PhD student at, at Stanford, um, we went and started exploring this in contemporary human data sets to actually um, look a little bit more deeply about what's going on. And when we did that, something really striking happened. So, um, there are three alleles um, at this stuffy locus. Um, the one that confers resistance to malaria is called FYO. So that's in green there. And what you see is that it's virtually fixed in Western, Eastern Africa. Okay? Uh, it's basically fixed everywhere except in Southern Africa. <laughs> and that's what you see in the Khoisan. So here, here are the Kumani San. And they, um, they do carry about 15 to 20% um, of the, of the Duffy null allele, but then very strikingly, they also carry FYA and FYB. And that's what you see outside of Africa, okay? So everybody outside of Africa, pretty much, um, except in some cases, carries 
um, the FYB and FYA alleles. And people thought that those alleles were recent, okay? <laughs> Uh, but in, instead, actually, what we were able to demonstrate is that those alleles were very ancient alleles. They were segregating in, those, uh, in a population in Africa. Um, uh, Duffy Null is a much more recent event, probably 50 to 60,000 years um, old is the age of the allele. And that, that population carrying the allele um, at very low frequencies, so the ancestral allele frequency was estimated to be only about 0.1% in the ancestral population, but then they move into an environment where malaria is occurring, and then there's very, very rapid, strong selection for that uh, FYO allele, and it becomes fixed in those Central and East African populations. Um, so this is sort of the pattern I was more expecting um, to see if indeed like the Southern Refugium hypothesis was correct. So now we have at least sort of this one example that does fit the pattern, but then like my skin pigmentation example doesn't fit the pattern. So like I said, it's, it's a messy story, but you know, that's why it's science and got to spend years working on this. So um, I think I'll just go ahead and end there because I'm a little bit out of, of time, but I'm very happy to take questions. Um, and then I just want to briefly acknowledge um, my lab and in particular, Alicia Martin, who led the skin pigmentation work along with uh, Meng Lin. Uh, Christian New, who's worked with me on many, many of these projects, who's at University of Colorado. Uh, Marlu Muller, who is the investigator at Stellenbosch in South Africa that we collaborate closely with. Um, uh, my field manager, uh, Justin Myrick, and to say if you want access to the data, it's still up on my Stony Brook website, but <laughs> feel free to let me know. Do you have time for questions? Yeah. Would you think about looking at any of the other known alleles for resistance to malaria in your little endeavors? Of which yes. There are many. Yeah, so there are several uh, uh, genes that are known to um, uh, convert resistance or uh, less susceptibility to Plasmodium falciparum. Um, some of those have actually been dated, so GPC, um, uh, G6PD is a very recent event. That's within the last 5,000 years. There's a couple of others. We're actually working on sickle cell right now as well. We're doing a bunch more sequencing for sickle cell, but that also looks like it's a very recent event. Um, so yeah, so we do want to look at other malarial genes, and we're just kind of moving in sequence. But as far as I can tell, it was only Duffy Null, which was thought to be old. So yeah. Yeah. I noticed on your maps you show in the beginning the known populations from archaeological sites. Mm -hmm. But are you modeling as if there are sites unknown? Because where you're finding those sites are just areas of exposure. Yeah. So it's very likely that there's a lot in between those gaps. And I'm wondering how you deal with yeah. that. Yeah. So we've been, um, yeah, I've been talking a lot with other paleo people about whether or not there is good evidence for people living in Western Central Africa. Um, or if it's just taphonomic biases or where people are looking right now. Um, and they sort of like, we don't know. Yeah, so, <laughs> so, you know, partly nobody's looking. So uh, right now, no, I haven't been modeling Western Central, uh, yeah, Western Central Africa, but yeah, that's something that we should probably start doing moving forward. Like, yeah. I, I completely acknowledge it's, it's, a it's ev an evidence of absence issue. Yeah. yeah. We just, there's, you know, looking at, my colleagues, all paleoanthropologists, mm -hmm. there's no one working in these other areas that we don't know that are our exposures. Right, right. So we, w we really have no idea. No one's going to be able to tell you really yeah. if there's something there. Or not, yeah, so. during the Middle Stone Age. Yeah, but maybe it's a good way to get some funding to go do that. Right, no, that's, that's absolutely yeah. true. We have to stop the wars first. Yeah, <laughs> yeah Paula, yeah, there's definitely. <laughs> Um, political situations, right. you know, getting access to the areas, forested areas, right. archaeologists aren't going to go to. Right. So there's just so many issues with. Even in that. Nigeria, I would think that isn't. I mean, Nigeria's pretty. Well, there there's certainly yeah, areas so where you could, yeah. but you know, it's having someone taking the risk and getting funding to go out. And right, do that. right. It's not as easy as going to say East Africa and the Rift Valley where you know yeah. you're going to find. So. Right, right. So. Yeah. That's part of the issue. No, I, I, yeah, I, I hear you. Yeah. Do you have another question? Me? Yeah. 
Oh, no, 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 no. That's it. <laughs> I just want to know how it was dealt with because it seems yeah. like a big challenge and, you know, you're modeling populations going back and forth, but it may not be that necessary in that. Yeah, and it's funny because most of the genetic data on Africa come from Western Africa. Um, I, I mean, when, when geneticists say they looked at African populations, they mean they looked at the Yoruba in Nigeria. <laughs> because that's the publicly da available data set. Most of the time they don't bother looking anywhere else. So yeah, there's a complete mismatch actually between you know, the paleo information and the genetic information yeah. in that regard. Yeah. I'm sure it's difficult to resolve as well. So. well I think sometimes geneticists are just lazy. Yeah. <laughs> Other questions? Yeah. Are you getting a divergent state for the, the malaria alleles? Um, yes, well, so the Duffy No one, I think I put it up there. I sort of flipped through. Yeah, so I think um, we did, well, we, the, the allele is still old, but the um, evidence for the sweep is more recent. So I think um, 45 to 60 was sort of the range of the time that the sweep would have started. So about 50,000 years ago, according to our model. Yeah. And so I guess, how are you, I guess, reconciling the fossil data, the fossils like from Jebel Aru, the 300,000, or from Omakibish or Herto, with the rest of the genetic data? Is it you're getting earlier appearance of morphology and then later appearance of divergence of, of genetic data? I think, so, so that's why I spent like a bunch of time on the first half of my talk. I'm like, well, I'm re really trying right now, because we can't speak to each other. Like, I, I went to this conference at Oxford, and it's just like, Spent the entire first day going like this, like you know, the paleo paleo people say one thing and the geneticists say another. Like they don't, yeah. So I'm really, really trying to, right now to um, to integrate those that information. I we are literally just at like we are putting crosses on maps phase, like, <laughs> and then we'll move forward from there. Um, but yes, I I personally think that you know the um, most of the anatomy appears first, and then for some reason one of the subpopulations is more successful in terms of population growth and the others. And uh, people like John Hoffecker, I know, also have written about this, and that's sort of what he thinks is going on. Um, it's not quite clear why that one subpopulation would be more successful than the others. So, yeah. Yeah. Cultural innovation, you know, genetic innovation, who knows what's going on. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah. Um, are there any theories other than um, the drought period that could have changed the migration of populations or extinctions? Ooh. Yes. Okay, so I think the, um, I actually took that other model out. I think the the alternative model to the kind of mega drought um, idea is that you do have population persistence in each of these regions, but then the, that one sub subpopulation is very, very um, successful, and so it basically demographically outcompetes the others. So then it incorporates, you know, it expands into Eastern Africa. There are people there. It incorporates them into the population, but that one subpopulation is so is growing so much faster that you just don't see much of the signature from those other groups. So that. Um, is also a model we'd really like to test, but I didn't go over it because of time. Yeah, so um, that's, yeah, we're trying, yeah, exactly, we're trying to put a, together a few of these alternates. Yeah, yeah. So the, the malarial allele, that fixed prior to the Bantu expansion? Absolutely. So then the Bantu still carried that? That's right. Still across the region that was already occupied by people who was still already fixed in. So if you look here, this is the Zulu. And the Zulu are Bantu speakers in Southern Africa, and 75% um, uh, of the allele is, is FYO. And then they have about uh, 15 to 20% of these FYA and B, which we can actually show come from the Khoisan haplotype. So it was an uh, admixture with Khoisan individuals in South Africa after they move in about 800 years ago. Yeah, so no, the Bantu speakers are all carrying the Duffy null. Yeah. Good question. Yeah. So just to be clear, the uh, the skin pigmentation and the malaria are sort of giving you different results. Like the one is coming in from Europe, yeah, and then the malaria is coming is older than. Right, that's right. Yeah, so completely different stories right now. Um, I mean, it w it may just be that 
The first skin pigmentation gene we picked to do this evolutionary modeling has a very different story than the rest of them. I have no idea. Um, it's, yeah, it, I mean, I just can't tell you how much time we spent simulating different scenarios. And I'm like, uh, yeah, it just turns out that it's a really, really recent event in the Khoisan. Yeah. So I'm just wondering what actually is the data that goes into this? Like, how many people? Oh, sure. Their samples? Oh, yeah. Um, so, uh, for this data set, let's see, we had about maybe 60 Komani San and 100 Zulu, and all these other populations are roughly between 60 and 100 individuals per population. This is all 1,000 genomes. Um, for my data, um, for the NAMA, we have about 200 NAMA samples and um, 250 uh, Komani San samples with paired skin pigmentation phenotypes. and. Um, the, in terms of the genetic data, we actually essentially sample uh, mutations across the entire genome. So we sample about a million mutations across the genome. But then for the skin pigmentation genes, we actually went in and resequenced the entire gene for 400 individuals. So we have kind of perfect information at that gene. And we've re resequenced about 30 skin pigmentation genes right now. So we have a lot to kind of work through. Um, but that's, I mean, for. This sort of work in Africa, it's very, it's very large data. Um, of course, if you were to do this sort of thing outside of Africa, you use you know, many, much larger sample sizes. Do you anticipate growing the samples like exponentially at this point, or is that something that's just hard to do because of funding? I mean, looking at all the places you're getting samples doesn't look like an easy task to collect. Them. Yeah, it's, oh, it's not. Um, so. For me, one of like the the Alicia's paper um, that came out last year in Cell was it was such a big deal um, because we were able to map skin pigmentation with 400 individuals. Like people didn't think you could do that, <laughs> um, and it has uh, it's partly to do with um, population endogamy and similarity of haplotypes and things like that, which are very different from the architecture in other populations. Um, I will say that we have now done the same thing for height. We have found um, large effect height alleles in the Khoisan with, um, again, like 400 individuals. And this is in contrast to when, if you do it with Europeans, they use like 10,000 individuals. So it's, um, it's kind of remarkable that we're actually able to do some of this work with very small sample sizes. Um, I'm trying now to submit grants to the NIH and say, we need much larger sample sizes, but I can't just do this on sort of small anthropological field grants. Like, $20,000 for a field grant isn't going to get me 1,000 individuals, 2,000 individuals. So we're, um, but you know, that's kind of kind of come from a different funding agency than we've been working with before. Is it easier to do, or do you need less in terms of sample size because there's less gene flow between these groups? Is that what's going on? Um, yeah, it's, um, it's sort of a complicated answer, but uh, for height, so um, there's less variation in the environment amongst individuals that impacts height. So you can almost think of it as a more heritable, narrow sense heritable trait in the Khoisan than it is in Europeans, outbred Europeans from Boston, which have um, very different diets, um, very different uh, European ancestry backgrounds that are all going in, and so they're actually sort of a poor, poor way to map height. Um, but then if you have this endogamous group of people with low gene flow between them and others um, and low environmental variability amongst households, then in fact you can do a pretty nice job. You have higher power. Um, so that's what I think is going on. And also the, uh, the size of the allele, the effect that it has, is much larger, it seems like, than most other groups. Um, so they've actually done this in Sardinians as well. They'll be the other example. They've and they mapped a large effect height gene in Sardinians with about a thousand people. It's the only other example I know, and it's a similar case where it's like an island population, very s genetically similar to each other. So something's going on with that. All right. Well, thank you all for coming. Let's get Brendan.